Is it really worth it? That's the question that some of my friends were asking about their internet bill. Now, a while back, I was receiving some mail. There was a flyer in the mail that I got, and it made me feel really special because there was a company out there that wanted to offer me internet at a really low price for the first year. And so I called them, and I made an account. And when my friends heard, with the same company, heard what I was getting for about $100 less each month, and that I was getting more than what they were getting for that amount of money, they called. They were, they were shocked. So they called the company and said, we've been loyal customers for five years, not five days like I had been, and uh, we want the same deal as this other person. And they said, it didn't matter, you don't get the same deal. And then after a year, I went to cancel my account, and when I called them, they actually told me that they would give me the same deal for eight more months, and I took it, of course, and so I kept, continued to do this, and my friends were outraged. They were doing the math and thinking, how much, money, how much more money are we spending every single 30 days? So they called this company again. They said, we've been a loyal customer, and it feels like there is no benefit to being a customer anymore. And that company, again, declined and said, no, you can keep paying what you are paying. And then after that eight months, I called them again and said, I'd like to cancel my account. And I really do think that the lady on the phone liked me a lot because she offered me an even better deal to keep me as a customer. And so my friends were thinking, this is ridiculous. There, there's no benefit of being a loyal customer, especially when I never signed any contract. And so they called again and said, can I get this deal? And they said no. So they canceled their account and went with a different company. Now, the reason why I tell you this is because we can all relate to the frustration and those feelings that my friends have when we find that we've been loyal, that we've been committed to something for so long, and other people are coming in and getting better benefits than we are, and it's just, it just makes us feel like, like it's not worth it anymore. And we cringe inside, wondering, why do they get better treatment than me when I've been loyal for so long? And it's that feeling, that question when you question whether loyalty actually has any payoff that I want to talk about this morning. And it's more important to ask this question about whether it's actually worth it to be loyal, to be committed to following Jesus. I mean that those who live for Christ, those who have committed their lives to obe obeying God, they've, they've, they've made drastic changes, radical changes in their lives to say, from now on, this is where I'm going. And just because they made that, that switch, their life is going to be so much harder. And from there, they are told to deny themselves. They're told to pick up their cross and to follow Christ. Now, when they did this, they thought that this wasn't just the right decision. They thought it was a good decision, the best decision that they would ever make. But now life is hard. And even though they're committed to this, they're looking around in the world and seeing that other people are, are living the life that they wanted to have. So the question is, is it worth it in the end to be loyal to Christ, to stay committed to Him, to obeying His commands, even though our lives don't always reflect the benefits of doing so? This is the question that the people in this text are asking. And this is the question that we all need to answer today and every day that we follow Christ. And what Malachi is going to show us is the amazing benefits that we get from serving God and also how it is that we can determine whether we truly do believe that it's worth it to serve God or not. So let's read our text this morning in Malachi chapter 3, verses 13, all the way to chapter 4, verse 3. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the arrogant blessed. Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then once more you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. 
The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall rise with healing in his wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under, your, uh, under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Now in this text, we meet uh, two different people. There's two groups here. The first group is found in verses 13 to 15. The second group is found in verse 16. But before we meet them, I want you to notice, I want you to remember that both of these groups here, both of them grew up in Israel. And so they would have heard the family story about how long ago God, the the good creator of all things, made a covenant with their forefathers. It was a promise, an eternal promise to bless them and to give life to them Not only the forefathers, but also all the descendants in Israel who would obey his commands. And so they would grow up hearing the stories. They would learn the lessons that they learned along the way. They would see that it's so important that they obey God's commands and what the blessings will look like. And also what the curses would look like if they disobeyed him. They would change their lives other than other nations around the world. They would go to the temple. They would offer sacrifices to their God. They would pray to their God. And over time, they would learn all these promises, especially the promise that one day God would make them into a great kingdom. And that one day, a great king would be sent by God to defeat all of their enemies and to set up a throne and to to serve on that, to, to rule on that for eternity. So even though they all, all those Israelites would have done this, God still sees them in two distinct groups. So as we look at these these groups of people, we need to understand that they're all Israel, but God still makes a distinction. See, on one level, human beings are human beings, and all of us before God are seen in the same way. But in another way, as we'll see in our text today, God distinguishes between one group and another group by how they answer the question, is it worth it to serve God? So as we look at this text, I want you to consider whether you could truly say that this morning. Whether it is worth it to serve God for the rest of your life. Is there a payoff? Are there benefits that make your life better than if you didn't serve God in the first place? And we'll also see the reminder of the blessings that God gives to those who truly serve Him. Now the first group we meet is in verse 14. They don't believe that serving God is actually worth it. And you can learn this by what they say. In verse 14 it says, It is vain to serve God. It's pretty clear that they don't think that there's any payoff in serving God. But remember, this isn't coming from people who kind of hear about this and say, "Ah, I don't think it's worth it. This is people who have grown up doing the things that God requires, living in Israel. And after all of that, they say that it's vain. These people went to the temple. They offered sacrifices. We learn in Malachi that they even wept when God wouldn't accept their offering. So it seemed as though they had served God for a period of time, but now they're saying, it's vain. It's worthless. It hasn't made my life any better. It also says this. It looks for evidence, so show me that it's worth it. It says, what is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So they think back and they think of all these things that they've done. They live differently than the other nations. They've kept watch over their lives, specifically in terms of God's command. They want to obey His law. They want to avoid breaking His commands. They've gone to the temple. They've done all these things. And yet, at the end of all of this, as they looked for that promised king and thought, it's not, it's not happening. Where are the benefits? Where's all the payoff of serving God? And in the end, they say they profit nothing from it. They're asking this question, but they're actually making a statement. There is nothing. There is no profit in serving the Lord. In fact, they even think it's a cruel trick. If you look at verse 15, it takes it one step further. He says, And now we call the arrogant blessed. So the arrogant would be those who don't serve God, who don't obey His law. And they're looking at their lives and saying, they're the ones that are being blessed, not us. We're seeking the blessing and we don't see it anywhere. And we look at the evildoers And they're the ones getting what we actually want for ourselves. They think they're better off than than serving God. They say that evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. 
And so as they look at these people who have no intention of serving God, they live however they want, they indulge in sin, they do all of these things, they put God to the test, and they get away with it all. This is, this is what they're looking at and saying, I want that. That's what I want, and I don't see any benefit of serving God. In fact, my life is harder and worse because I do. It seems as though the only reason that these people, this group of people, is serving God is because they were born in Israel, because they grew up learning that these are the laws, this is how we're supposed to live. But if they had it their way, they would leave the country, they would live like hell, indulge in all the earthly pleasures that they wanted to. They would eat, drink, and be merry, for there is no benefit to serving God. That's their conclusion after all of this. And as I think about this, I, I think I, I've been tempted to say the same thing. Because my parents went to church every morning, or every morning, every Sunday, and so did I. And so I went to Sunday school, I learned all the foundational biblical stories, I was even in the Christmas choir at church, I, I did all the church things, I memorized Bible verses, and I was at church enough to know where all the good hiding spots were. At home, we would have family devotions, we would pray before our meals and before bed, and every Christmas morning we would read the Christmas story before we opened all the presents. And then as I grew up, I went into the youth group, and I learned more about what it meant to serve God, what it looked like. I went on a mission to serve the poor in downtown Seattle. I got baptized when I was in grade 12. And so people were looking at my life, and they were saying that he's a good Christian kid. He goes to church, and he doesn't get into trouble. But the question is, was my life exponentially better because I did those things or not? In other words, if I were to do it all again, if I had to grow up in, a, in that family or a different family, would I do it the same? Or would I ditch God for, for something else, something that was better for me? Well, let's go deeper than just the words here. We need to look at these people's hearts. Look at verse 14 again. Notice why they're giving up on God. They're looking for a payoff, but they're not seeing it. They, they don't find it. They're not seeing what the payoff is. Now, this book in Malachi and the whole Bible is filled with promises of God's blessing. So they're not wrong to think, where are these blessings? But I think what they're doing is looking in the wrong place. They're told that God is faithful. The previous verse said, test me in this. Test my faithfulness and I will show you that you will be blessed. And so maybe they were doing that. Maybe they were thinking that I'm going to do this and they're still not seeing those blessings. And so the question is, is God trustworthy, or are they looking for blessings in the wrong place? See, what are the blessings they're actually looking for? In verse 15, they're calling the ungodly people blessed. Now, why would they do that? Because they're looking at their lives, and they're saying, well, well they're doing whatever they want. They don't have to change everything and make sure that they're obeying all of these laws. And at the same time, they're, they're living evil lives. They're doing evil, and they're getting away with it. And in the end, that's exactly what they wanted for themselves. We've all been tempted to think this way as well. If I could just, if I did that, I would feel guilty or I couldn't do it because I know it's against God's law. But really, is there any distinction between living righteous and living wicked? Is there any reason for me to think that serving God and making my life harder because of that is worth all the effort doing that? And in the end, these people... This group of people would have said something like this. They would have said, I serve God so that God serves me. It, it was very legalistic. They were looking. They said, I obeyed a command and my life's not immediately better. Therefore, it's not worth it. It's very much where the Pharisees come out of in the New Testament. Right in the next book, in Matthew, in the New Testament, we see these Pharisees and they're acting like this. They're saying, I do all these things. I obey all these commands so that God will pay me back in some way. So they're saying that it's not worth it. They're ditching God because God isn't giving them what they're trying to use him to get. This is confirmed when we look again through earlier parts of Malachi. We notice that they actually didn't care about God at all. They did go to the temple. They did worship there. They brought their animals for sacrifices. But what kind of animals did they bring? Blind, lame, and sick animals. The worthless ones. They dishonored God in their sacrifices. We learned in chapter 2 that they were neglecting God's word. They had no intention of hearing his voice, knowing his commands. 
They didn't long to, to obey him. And so they lived in sin because they neglected his law. They did what tradition was, but they didn't actually care to hear his own voice. And then they were weeping at the altar, it says, over God not accepting their offerings when they were busy divorcing their wives and marrying other women who worshipped idols. And the whole time they're despising him, they're dishonoring him, and they're doubting him. And they have no remorse for any of it. And verse 13, it says, Your words are hard against me, says the Lord of hosts. God says, your words are hard against me. And we're supposed to get this idea that these words that they're talking about, it is vain to serve God, is just like coming from a heart that's like Pharaoh's, hardened heart. They were willfully defiant. They, they were unyielding to any of God's gracious calls to return to him. They, they didn't want to hear it. They despised God. He isn't giving them what they want in life. And so they would answer this question by saying, no, it is not worth it to serve God. Of course not. He's not giving us what we want. And if you look at other people, they're getting that stuff. So it's really, there's, it's really no payoff at all to serve God. And I wonder if you look into your heart that maybe these are words that you've maybe not said out loud, but thought. Maybe you've actually just felt these feelings before. But to answer this question for yourself today, is it worth it to serve God? God's not only going to look at your words, the answer, He's going to look at your heart. And we can trick people, we can deceive people, but we cannot deceive God. He looks deeper. And personally, I know that it's hard in some churches to go through times of doubt where you're searching, where you're really questioning things genuinely. You want to know, is it worth it? Because today it doesn't feel like that. And there are some churches that frown upon questions about God and times of searching in people's lives. They just kind of say, nope. And people are conditioned to put on masks and to, and to keep all their doubts secret. Meanwhile, everyone else in that church is doing the exact same thing. And what I want to encourage us in is that if this is what you're asking this morning, if this is what you're truly wondering, and there are days when you might feel this way. Christians feel like this sometimes. I'd rather you explain them to, to not keep silent, but to explain it to people and say, this is how I'm feeling. And ask them to encourage you. Ask them to remind you of the blessings, that it is worth it in the end. Because if we, re if we forget how sinful we are, if we forget how human we are, if we forget how weak our, our flesh really is, then we're not going to support and encourage one another as God has designed His church to be. And so all this to say is that if you're struggling with this question right now, maybe by asking it, you've begun to think, you know, I don't know. Is it really worth it? How would you explain this to a friend who asked you that question? What would you say to them? And if you're searching for an answer, or at least a good answer this morning, then keep listening. Keep searching. For Malachi is going to show us what it means to be able to say yes to that and also the benefits that we receive that these people weren't even noticing. So let's meet the second group of people now. Verse 16 describes them very simply. He calls them those who feared the Lord. Now, we're not told anything of what they said. It says that they started to speak to one another, but we don't know what they said. There's no words here. All we know is that they feared the Lord. And it's a matter of the heart. This is what distinguishes them from the other group. The other group was talking, and you can tell what they were like. And this group feared the Lord. That's the difference. It's a matter of the heart. If you were to merely look at the actions of the first group, they would be at the temple, they would be offering sacrifices, and from a distance you might say, they're, they're serving God. But once you hear what they're saying, you know that they're not. And in this group here, we're told that they fear the Lord. It doesn't matter what they say. We can assume that they are honoring to God, that they truly love and serve the Lord. Now, when it comes to fearing the Lord here, it doesn't mean that we're scared. That's often how we think of that word, that we're scared of God or something like that. This word is, is often used in the Bible as, as respect or honor or, or something like that, that they would revere God. And basically what this means, how I would explain it, is that you understand who God is and you treat him accordingly. So even just in the book of Malachi, we've heard things like, God is the Lord of hosts. We've heard that many times, which means that he is the commander of the army of heaven. Is that how you see God? 
Is that how you come before him as the commander of the armies of heaven? Malachi has also told us that he is a great king in all the earth, and therefore he is worthy of all praise and honor and glory and even your and everyone's submission. Is that how you see God? Do you fear him like that? We're told that that God is unchanging in justice, and He will give to everyone exactly what they deserve in the last day. Is that how you see Him? Do you see Him as the God of holiness, that we might not sin against Him, that we shouldn't trifle with Him or tread lightly in His presence? Is that how you see Him? But these people who feared the Lord, that's what they knew. They believed and, and truly understood who God was, and they treated Him accordingly. They feared the Lord. Later in verse 16, it says that they esteemed his name. And this builds on the fear of God. So these people esteemed him, meaning that they thought so highly, they valued God so highly, and loved his glory, that they would fear doing anything in their life that would diminish his glory. They would would guard themselves against that. In other words, they loved God so deeply and valued him so highly that they loved to obey him. They wanted to make much of God. And that's the difference between these two groups of people. One was looking for a payoff, but in the wrong place. The other one is looking for the payoff, and they're getting it. They're getting God himself. The payoff for them was immediate and constant. They saw it because they were looking in the right place. And, and so what are they? What, where are the, be- the benefits What are the blessings? One group is looking for the temporary treasures of this life, health, wealth, security, good reputation, popularity, whatever it might be. That's not what God has promised to give us. But instead, this other group is overflowing with joy because they are getting what they treasure most, the one they fear and the one they esteem most, which is God himself. And I wonder if this is you. Is God your greatest treasure? If He's not, God isn't afraid to entice you even with explaining what the benefits really are. Because all of the benefits that we're going to see here actually culminate in God Himself. So when we go through these four benefits that Malachi will bring up, if if you desire worldly wealth more than God, then these benefits won't excite you at all. You won't want them. You'll say, that's not worth it. But if you truly value God more than anything else than this world can offer you, then you will, you will think that this is too good to be true. That because what you get is what you want most, God himself. So verse 16 says this, The Lord paid attention to those who feared him, and he heard them. So that's the first benefit. The first benefit of serving God is his personal attention. So what they're they're saying is that although God is all-knowing, he would have heard every word that every other group of people, all the other people that say it's not worth it, he would have known what they said. He knew because he said, "Your your, your words are hard against me. He heard them, but in this case, he gives his personal attention. He draws near. He listens intently so that he understands his servants. This is what he does. And what better benefit would there be than for you to say, I've served God. I live for Him. And there are days when it's really hard. And when I cry out to God, I know that He hears my cry for help. That when I'm suffering, that when I'm being persecuted because I live for Christ, I know that God is drawing near to me and is sustaining me in that time. Or when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me. God sustains me. God will walk me through that valley. This is a benefit that those who truly serve God, who truly value Him, want. And they will have this as one of their benefits. Now, the second one that we see is even more encouraging, at least in my opinion, to the servants of God. It says, a book of remembrance was written before Him. Now, just imagine that. That God not only pays attention to you, He draws near to you, but he also records your name in heaven to say that I will remember you. So he's, he's doing more than just paying attention. He records it in a book of remembrance. But again, being God, he would, have, he would have known all of this. He would never forget. But he tells us in a way to encourage us 
This is a book of remembrance, and your name is written in it. Now, there are a couple books written in the, in the Bible here. It could be the book of life, which records everyone's name who will be saved through faith in Christ on the last day. It could also be one of the many books that contains all the deeds that every single person has done that will be opened on the day of judgment as well. But whatever book it is, God will not forget you. He will remember you. And so that's the second benefit of serving God, of being His servant, His permanent remembrance. And when it comes to the word in Hebrew for remembrance, it's actually more active than we think. Oftentimes we'll reminisce or we'll remember something that happened in the past. And that's kind of all we do. We just think about it. Maybe we talk about it. But in Hebrew, it's actually something that leads to action. It's almost a verb. To remember, it, it, it leads to more than just something, a thought in the mind, but an action in light of that thought. And so it's very much similar to God's remembrance of Noah. In the middle of the flood, God remembered Noah, it says. And it led him to act faithful to his promise to him, which was to protect him from death in the judgment of, wa of the water. And then we, we read it again, that God's remembrance of Israel, when they were slaves in Egypt, God remembers them, and it makes him act faithfully to his promise, which is to protect them from dying in Egypt under Pharaoh's judgment. And so it will be in the same way that this book of remembrance reminds God, so to speak, that we are His, who it is that is truly His servant. And on the last day, it will, act, it will cause Him to act in faithfulness to His promise to His servants, which is to protect them from eternal death on the day of judgment. And so this is another benefit of serving God, is that neither you, your name, nor any of your deeds will ever be forgotten. They will never be forgotten by God. Everything you do today in this life Serving God is worth it because you will receive the promised rewards one day. And the third benefit is in verse 17. It says, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. So God makes you his own possession. It says, my treasured possession even. When we think of servants as we think about them today, we often don't think of them very highly. We think of them in terms of, of being treated unfairly or as lesser than or inferior to the master. But with God, he treasures his servants. He, he treats them like beloved children of his own. And so the third benefit of serving God is his joyful delight. Now there's lots of things in your house that, that you might say are valuable. But what's the one thing that you would try to save if your house was on fire? Whatever that is, that's your treasure. That's what you value most. It may not be the most expensive thing in your house, but you treasure that. It means the most to you. And that's the idea we have here. God makes us into his treasured possession. He, he, he makes us that. He treasures us. He delights in us. He wants us. And when he looks at his servants, he is pleased. He is delighted. We are his treasure. And I know that many of us won't want to be a servant in this life. But when the master will treat you like his very own child, who wouldn't want that? And that's exactly what the fourth benefit is. It says in verse 17, I will spare them, his servants, as a man spares his own son who serves him. So everyone who serves God is actually treated like a son. And as we know in the New Testament, you're adopted into the family of God. Now, when it comes to a son, it's, it's very different from being a servant. In a household, there's a servant and there's a son, and they're, they're very different. But the son still serves his father, doesn't he? He obeys him. He, he tries to please him. The greatest joy of a son would be to please his father, to honor him, and to obey him. He loves his father, and a son would do anything to please his father. And a father, then, on the other hand, gives his son everything that he needs he, he provides for him. He always does good for his son so that he's blessed and so that he prospers in life. And when that father sees his son in danger or in need, he is moved by his compassion and his love for that son to, to, to lay down his own life to spare the son. And in the fourth benefit of serving God is his compassionate protection. So there are benefits, but the question is, is it worth it? 
Is serving God really worth it? And answering that question is a matter of the heart. We might know what we want to answer, but have you thought about this? Is it worth it? Why have you been serving God in your life if you don't think it's worth it? Those who live for money, those who live for power or popularity or security or wealth or whatever it might be, if that's what they desire in their hearts, then the blessings that God is offering to them don't excite them. They don't even want them. They don't want God. They want other things. And God wants to give you so much more joy and pleasure than those things could ever bring you in this life or the next. This is what God is offering to us. He's giving us himself, his personal attention, his permanent remembrance, his joyful delight, his compassionate protection. Therefore, only those who truly desire God, who love God more than anything else, who see God as glorious and beautiful, who want to live their life for Him because they love Him, only they will truly be able to say that, yes, serving God is so worth it. That there is nothing else that I would rather do and nothing else that you can offer me that would make me change my mind because I get God. The one whom I fear the one that I esteem. But because this is a matter of the heart for all of us, then something needs to change in our hearts. For we're reminded that that's where sin has such power over our lives, doesn't it? That we don't love God all the time. That we don't serve God. We don't even have the desire to do it at times. And so there's a battle going on in our hearts, and that's exactly what Jesus came to do, to deal with. To destroy the works of the devil, the Bible says. He died for that. He also died to make our spiritually dead hearts alive again. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says, By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. That even your faith today is a gift from God. Jesus has caused us to have those blinders removed that the devil has put on us so that we now see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And anyone who sees that will choose Him. It's the fact that we're blinded that we can't choose Him, but when those blinders are removed in faith by the work of the Holy Spirit through the death of Christ, we can now see God for who He is in Christ, and we will say, I want that. That is my greatest treasure. And we will then pursue Him, and only then can we serve God from our hearts. And there is no hope outside of Jesus, for only in Him is the forgiveness of sins earned and the eternal life that we desperately need, the, the wrath of God dealt with in our lives is in Christ. And in Him, we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places if you will trust Him for it. So what Malachi wants us to see here is to see in God, in Christ, everything that our heart truly longs for. But if this morning you don't treasure Christ, if this morning you don't see His beauty, don't trust in His death for forgiveness or eternal life, then cry out to Him. Call out to Him. Seek Him with all your heart until you find Him, especially while there's still time. Because there is a day coming for those who are saying, it's not worth it. I've tried it. I don't like it. It's not paying off in the way that I want it to. Or to think that I'd rather just be evil because God doesn't seem to, to make a distinction between anyone. There is a dreadful day of judgment to come. But on that day, those who fear the Lord, not today, we don't get everything, all the benefits today. We get a taste of them. But in, on that day, the, those who fear the Lord will get for eternity everything that God has promised to give them. Ultimately, God himself. And look at verse 18. It is to encourage us all to fear and serve the Lord. It says, then, on that day, then, once more, you shall see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and one who does not serve Him. And we'll look at the rest of this verse next week or the, next, the rest of this passage next week. But for now, friends, I pray that you will see the beauty, the benefit of serving God. That you would fear Him in your heart and long to serve Him and honor Him in your life. 
And that is a work of God. And so I pray that God would show you that it is more than worth it to serve Him in this life. For when, we, when God is your treasure, God, in fact, treasures you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word that teaches us over and over again, reminding us of your promises. And what it will come down to in the end is whether we will trust you or not. And there are many people here who may be like those Israelites who grew up in the church, who know all the Bible answers, who've been here and are so familiar with everything about Christianity that they don't stop and think anymore as to whether it's worth it, whether they're actually enjoying this or not. And so I pray that this morning you would speak to them, that you would remind them of your goodness and your faithfulness to these promises. That when we look around the world and we see other people getting some of the things our hearts long for, that we would be reminded again that whether we receive the benefits today or we will get them one day in eternity, we will get them. And that you are faithful. I thank you that you tell us here that you will give us your attention, that you will never forget us, that you delight in us, that there is joy in our relationship with you, and there's peace, and also that you protect us and that you will keep us until the last day. And for those who are still questioning this, or those who've never thought about this before, Father, I pray that you would speak to their hearts, that you would show them yourself, your glory, your beauty, and that they would long to serve you. And may you change their hearts by your Holy Spirit and work in their lives, transforming us all to love you more deeply every day. And that our lives, no matter how difficult they get, would be a life that is serving and honoring to you and that the benefits of you would be worth it in our eyes and in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.